Thank you for being with us. Um, my name is Amelia Layton. I'm the Public Programs Manager in the Education and Community Engagement Department at the Tacoma Art Museum. I want to start by acknowledging that we are that we learn, live, reflect, and teach on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people. As our museum is specifically situated on the traditional homeland of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians, we make intentional efforts to create inclusive and respectful partnerships that honor indigenous cultures, histories, identities, and socio-political realities. Throughout today's discussion, you're encouraged to ask questions in the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen and to make use of the chat. I will be monitoring both. And if your question isn't answered right away, we'll make sure to have time at the end to answer everyone's questions. We are here with the Race and Pedagogy Institute because of the Kinsey Collection at the Tacoma Art Museum. Uh, Dr. Gordon was an invaluable member of our community advisory panel for the exhibition and helped connect, connect us. The Kinsey African American Art and History Collection celebrates the achievements and contributions of Black Americans from 1595 to present times. Considered one of the most comprehensive surveys of African American history and culture outside of the Smithsonian Institution, the exhibition is one of the same. The exhibition of the same name features the shared treasures amassed by Shirley and Bernard Kinsey during their five decades of marriage. We hope you all have had time or will have a chance to see the exhibit at TAM on view through November 28th. Give yourself some time with it. Um, now the Race and Pedagogy Institute in their 18 years of sustained focus and collaborative work, they have staged a range of more than 20 summits and conferences, spawned an assortment of collaborations across academia and communities, provided a variety of educational resources for transformative pedagogy in the Puget Sound campus and beyond, brought together disparate communities to generate vigorous thinking about race equity and, edu race equity and education, inspired a plethora of initiatives focused on the work of education and equality in both K-12 and higher education, and have been one of the voices of change seeking to transform the landscape of education on their campus and beyond. All of this has been undertaken as a part of their mission of educating teachers and students at all levels to think critically about race and to act to eliminate racism. I'm gonna hand it over to Renee Sims who has been a wonderful partner for these lectures. And I thank you all for being here. Thank you, Amelia. Um, happy to be here today. Happy to um, see all of the people who are um, responding in the chat to let us know that you're here. Uh, in the spirit of our pedagogical community and our responsibility to the historical, I'd like to share our land acknowledgement, which was created um, for the RPI um, conference in 2018, in three years ago, or four, three years ago, um, in September of 2018. We begin this session with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the Puyallup Nation on whose land we stand. Despite being the targets of invasion, occupation, and displacement leading to centuries of trauma, the Puyallup people have extended to us the courtesy of a welcome to their home. We are guests and beneficiaries of this welcome. Through this acknowledgement, we signal our participation in the necessary project of reimagining the social contracts between native people and the rest of us who have shown up through different routes to these native nations. Our solidarity is with native people in their efforts to end generations of historical trauma. Breathe in the beauty of these settings beside the Salish Sea. As guests do take full advantage of every opportunity for learning and growth, but please do so with an awareness of the living heritage of the land on which we stand. This statement was developed as part of the preparations for the 2018 Race and Pedagogy National Conference at the University of Puget Sound. Professor and Director of the Race and Pedagogy Institute, Dexter Gordon developed the statement with the help of Professor Grace Livingston with input from the Yallop Tribe of Indians, Chief Leshai Schools Director of Parent and Community, Bina McLeod and Professor Doug Sackman. Um, thank you, Amelia and uh, Tam, for partnership on the series of conversations inspired by decades of curation by Bernard Shirley and Khalil Kinsey. 
Their collection provides an opportunity for Tacoma to engage with art and artifacts that represent the majestic sweep of African-American life. The stories presented by the objects in their collection are painful, glorious, and profound. These are stories at the center of what my colleagues and I teach in African-American studies at University of Puget Sound. We are the only African-American studies program in the state of Washington to offer this disciplinary major. Our current director, Professor Grace Livingston and past director, Professor Dexter Gordon began building this program 19 years ago with two guiding principles, rigorous scholarship and responsible community engagement. Our program uses an infusion model, which means that we work to infuse our curriculum throughout the campus, collaborating with other departments and offices like theater arts, music, history, study abroad, English, the Center for Writing and Learning, the School of Education, environmental policy and decision-making, psychology, and others. But the campus site that is a direct enactment of the issues that arise out of the field of African-American studies and which serves as an intellectual home for these ideas is the Race and Pedagogy Institute and its Community Partners Forum. As Amelia said, um, the invitation to partner with TAM came to the Institute's leadership through contact with Professor Gordon. Amelia, uh, TAM's invitation allows us to do the work we are committed to and engage daily. And we've been excited all year about this collaboration. We hope to bring to these conversations the intellectual expertise of our leadership team and its community partners, like Rosalind Bell, who you will hear from today, the rigorous scholarship of African-American studies faculty like professors Latoya Brackett and Nancy Bristow, and the knowledge and expertise of staff and students like Jalen Antoine and Carissa Ritasel. Along with TAM, we want to cr think critically about narratives of race and racism as they are presented in this collection at this particular time. Which brings me to my final point. We are living in the time of the Black Lives Matter movement. As a result, we have begun reckoning with history in ways that this exhibition and the title of today's workshop um, communicate. This reckoning is happening internationally, nationally, in the city of Tacoma, and on our campus. Local examples include the renaming of Wilson High School to Dolores Silas High School, the University of Puget Sound Committee to rename buildings on the campus, the Legacies Project, at UPS, which examines relationships our university has had in the broader community, and the re-examination of the violent history of indigenous boarding schools in our region. This work of reconsidering our legacies, reclaiming history, along with the creative telling and teaching of these histories, our interests and expertise that all of today's presenters bring. I'm really looking forward to their conversation. I think everyone is going to enjoy it. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Carissa. Thank you, Dr. Sims. Um, I'm Carissa Redesell. I'm a third year student at Puget Sound and I am beyond happy that this is the first event that I'm getting to be part of uh, and bringing to the community uh, this year. Um, I have been a RPI student staff since I first started at the university. And um, this is very much uh, one of the many reasons that I'm so happy that that is, that that is the work that I get to do. Um, I came to Puget Sound from Albuquerque, where I've lived for the last nine years. But before that, I went to elementary school in Olympia, Washington. And there were many elementary school trips to museums and um, they were all uh, wonderful and I learned many things, but I can't imagine getting it that at the time I would have gotten to see an exhibit like the one that's currently at the Community Art Museum. And that's extremely exciting to me that eh, this is something that people are getting to see now. Um, I'm also a math and physics, uh, a math major uh, that's focusing also on physics. And this isn't something that I would get to see or do in part of my academic areas. So 
the opportunity and the drive to get to see things like this and understand things like this is extremely important and to me. And I think it's part of the thing of Puget Sound of people being exposed to things outside of what their main area is. And this is a tremendous opportunity to get to do that. So in this collection, we have the bust of Fred Frederick Douglass, which was created by the sculptor Tina Allen in 2003. Um, the sculpture was one of the uh, one uh, one of her sculptures of um, distinguished African Americans and Africans that also includes Malcolm X and Nelson Mandela. Um, we also have the uh, the letter uh, written in 1954 describing a um, a young enslaved woman in who was to be sold and did not know that they were going to be uh, sold, who was valued and seen as property and commodified in a way that um, is disturbing but cannot be forgotten. Um, now, the wonderful uh, panel that we'll be uh, uh, hearing from today our Dr. Latoya Brackett was an assistant professor of African American studies and a member of the race and pedagogy leadership team at the University of Puget Sound. She earned her bachelor's degree in African Africana studies at Cornell University and her doctorate in African American and African studies at Michigan State University. One of the hardest things for her as an African-American female scholar is grappling with the fact that her own family's history can never fully be known. She thus truly appreciates families like the Kinsey's for curating African-American artifacts when for centuries, our histories have been hidden, silenced and erased. Now, Dr. Brackett will be speaking with uh, Jalen Antoine who is a student athlete at the University of Puget Sound, double majoring in African American studies and economics. Jalen is involved in a multitude of campus organizations as well as the African American Studies Department and to help seek to further, diverse, uh, to further diversity and equity around the community. He is thankful to share his stories and adventures while studying abroad in Ireland and share what he learned about the legacy of Frederick Douglass and how he felt connected to it. And Rosalind Bell was an artist in residence in theater arts and African American studies for the fall of 2007 at University of Puget Sound. The New Orleans monologues, Rosalind's play about Hurricane Katrina was developed during her UPS residency and staged readings and workshop productions. Rosalind Bell returned as an artist in residence in the theater or arts and African American studies for the fall of 2008 at the university. During her 2008 UPS residency, she began a first draft of her newest play, 1620 Bank Street, about high school integration in Southwest Louisiana. It was, it was given in a staged reading in November and December of 2008 at the University of Puget Sound. In January 2008, Rosalind was among those named in Innovator by the California-based Color Lines magazine. The News Tribune named her play, The New Orleans Monologues, one of the top 10 entertainments of 2007. From March to August 2008 was Makanato O writer in residence. Makonado O Writing Workshops is a week-long workshop created by Sandra Cisneros in San Antonio, Texas. In August 2008, the Cirque Noir, her screenplay about the rise and fall of the Duvaliers in Haiti, was given a staged reading at the downtown Los Angeles Film Festival. A short film of one of her stories, Tootie Pie, was screened at the Seattle International Film Festival in May in 2006. Rosalind was an artist in residence in schools through Pierce County Community Arts in 2007. And Rosalind, if you wanna give a, a wave and see if- Wrong bio, <laughs> mine, but it's the wrong one, sorry. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I gave it to you, I'm sorry, but go on. 
well, I think it's safe to say we have uh, the marvelous and wonderful Rosalind in any, in any, any form of bio. <laughs> um, yeah. And Dr. Nancy K. Bristow is a distinguished professor of history at the University of Puget Sound, where she also serves on the leadership team of the Race and Pedagogy Institute. She's an award-winning teacher. She is the author of three books, including most recently, Steeped in the Blood of Racism, Black Power, Law, and Order, and the 1970 Shootings at Jackson State College, published in 2020. Bristow attempts to bring to both her teaching and her scholarship a commitment to exploring the fundamental impact of white supremacy in shaping the American past and present and believes deeply in the power of historical study as a driver of social change. I want to thank everyone for being present and including me in this event and welcome everyone to begin. And with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Brackett and Jalen. Hi everybody. So I know Jalen's gonna share his screen and um, go ahead and share the title and then um, I will jump in after that. Hello everybody, my name is Jalen Antoine uh, and today uh, Dr. Bragg and I will be presenting uh, Black and Male in Ireland, a journey of reclamation and freedom from Douglas to me. All right, everybody. So um, before we kind of get into it, I want to um, acknowledge first um, and put into the space the pride that I feel to have supported Jalen in his very first international journey. Um, he was selected out of over 500 applicants to go to Ireland with the Frederick Douglass Global Fellows Program this summer, uh, a fully funded one month academic and experiential journey for students of color. This is a very particular um, organization and goal that they have. And so when he returned, he couldn't stop telling me about all the histories he learned and um, the ways he reflected on his own identity. So I'm really glad that we could have him speak today and connect to the journey of the past with um, his recent journey this summer. So um, Douglas's first, Frederick Douglass's first journey abroad was to Ireland, um, just as Jalen's was. Uh, so I thought that was really, really interesting. I think there's some other connections between him and um, Douglas as well. Uh, it's a very unique parallel, right, between the two of them. So I think we are in for a treat. So uh, Jalen and I will attempt to give an insight into the hidden journeys of Frederick Douglass um, in, in 1845, uh, where he went to, he went to Ireland in 1845 and also to Britain. And so alongside the journey, uh, Jalen had to Ireland himself. So there's a unique engagement for African-Americans as they journey abroad, um, something that I'm really passionate about myself. And the same has been for many of the historic greats in African-American history, like W.B. Du Bois, who, if you don't know, is laid to rest in Accra, Ghana. And I've ventured to his mausoleum many times now since I've, I go to Ghana quite a bit. Um, and then so, but Douglas, I never learned of his history. So when uh, this Douglas Fellows Program was like, we're going to Ireland, I was like, why? Uh, so with that, I think I'm gonna start off with the first question to Jalen. Um, under the hidden legacy kind of component that we're working with here, which is also on the slide. So we're trying to keep the, the questions on the slides for all of you to be able to follow as well. Um, so the first question for Jalen is, when you heard that Douglas had visited Ireland, what were your thoughts? Uh, my first thought was, I didn't know he went to Ireland. Um, there, you know, what's a common theme of many uh, black scholars traveling overseas to uh, give talks and speeches, especially to, it wasn't common for a lot of uh, black leaders and black scholars to give talks in Great Britain at the time. But when I first heard he went to Ireland, I was, Ireland, I didn't even know he made a stop there. So it, you know, I was taken, I was taken aback by that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so after that, I started having to do my own little research. Like, I don't know anything about this. And I'm a scholar at African American studies because this is yet a part of the hidden legacy. So um, yeah, so Ireland was uh, Douglas's like first international trip on his way to Great Britain. And so this is the next question for Jalen. What did you feel as you thought about going to Ireland yourself? Uh, I didn't know what to feel or think about going to Ireland. Uh, 
So the co cohort that I was uh, traveling with were all students of color and going to Ireland, which is a predominantly white country. I didn't know what to expect. Um, you know, going, being in the United States, we see all of these uh, different ways of kind of interpreting racism, at least in an American way of life. Uh, it was going to be different to see how myself and the other students interacted with the culture, with other people, with the politics of Ireland, uh, which we all really knew nothing about. We learned uh, not only of Frederick Douglass's uh, visit to Ireland, but we also learned kind of at the time he was visiting, you know, it was the Irish famine. Uh, and then uh, decades later, uh, the Irish struggle for independence against uh, Great Britain. Uh, so it was going to be interesting to see how, you know, students of color uh, particularly myself and a few others uh, who identified as Black, uh, we're going to engage with uh, this scholarship and see uh, how we could connect what we feel uh, back home to how we feel being abroad. All right. So, I uh, so Jalen, do you want to go to the next slide and share some of Douglas's actual thoughts about his journey? Um, to Ireland, and then after Jalen shares um, the quote here, he's going to read it so you all can follow along. Uh, we'll go to um, our next set of questions. Yeah, so when Frederick Douglass um, was in Ireland, uh, one of the towns that we visited uh, that he also uh, traveled to was the city of Cork, where he gave a about a two and a half hour speech uh, on the steps of uh, I believe the Lloyd, Lord Mayor's uh, quarters. So this was an excerpt from this speech. Uh, 11 days and half, a, half gone, and I have crossed 3,000 miles of the perilous deep. Instead of a democratic government, I am under a monarchical government. Instead of the bright blue sky of America, I am covered with the soft gray fog of the Admiral Isle. I breathe and lo, the chateau becomes a man. I gaze around in vain for one who will question my equal humanity Claim me as a slave or offer me an insult. I employ a cab. I am seated beside white people. I reach the hotel. I enter the same door. I am shown into the same parlor. I dine at the same table and no one is offended. I find myself regarded and treated at every turn with the kindness and difference paid to white people. When I go to church, I am met by no upturned nose and scornful lip to me. We don't allow Negroes in here. Frederick Douglass, 1840. I love hearing, well, actually, whenever I read this quote or have it read, I think of um, Langston Hughes' um, I2, you know, and it's the part of I2 Sing America. And so there's a lot of, uh, the narratives are very much similar across a lot of our uh, great African-American orators and leaders. So we want to talk about the idea of reclamation and repurposing and uh, how this shows up for, obviously, um, Frederick Douglass, right, um, in regards to being in Ireland and, and also Great Britain, and then uh, talking, bringing that to today with, with Jalen's own um, conversations there. And so, um, so Douglass, actually, it's after this trip to Ireland, and then he goes to Great Britain, um, that he's giving all these speeches and whatnot, and he actually is able to buy his freedom, thanks to an abolitionist group in Great Britain that gives him money, so that allows him to come back to the States. Um, I was reading through some histories of him, people saying that perhaps uh, Frederick Douglass wanted to live abroad. He wanted to move from the United States. He didn't want to go back and suffer considering what you all just heard him say about basically being a man, right? Not being something else, but being a man when he was abroad. Uh, but he ended up deciding to come back home anyway and continue the fight because he also talked about how he could see the possibility of freedom for African-Americans because he could see it in Great Britain. Um, and I think Great Britain had ended their slavery in 1833. Um, and so it would be, uh, and this is 1845 at the time. And then he gets his freedom in 1846 and then he comes back. So I'd also like to add just because I do, do traveling myself is that I know that when I go abroad, um, when I come home, I have a feeling of welcome or renewal of re or repurpose when I come back from being abroad um, because I know all that of what I am and how I'm perceived here. I know who I am in America, whether it's good or not, I know it clearly, right? And I can work through that. And so when I come home, I know it must be home because abroad was not home. Um, and it can be a really unique uh, dichotomy for being African-American specifically 
uh, being descended from enslaved folks, which was also discussed in a way in my bio about that complexity that I have with that history. Um, so, okay, so I know when Jalen, so I'm speaking to you now, so I know when you were in Ireland, there was much unknown about the culture, which made existing there a more complex reality than Douglas probably would have had. Um, Douglas obviously was more famous, right? People were excited to have him there. They hyped him up, right? They really appreciated that. And so, um, and of course, there is completely different for him. So let's discuss more currently in regards to reclamation and repurposing. So I have the question here for Jalen. Um, upon your return from Ireland, what did this trip provide for you that perhaps was not intended or anticipated originally? Uh, I guess one thing that I didn't anticipate originally uh, is how important it was to be alongside other students of color, uh, especially uh, black males. Uh, so I, you know, put the picture of the entire cohort on the top, but uh, below is a picture of uh, a couple of the Black men uh, that I journeyed around Ireland with. Uh, we went to so many different cities, but what was important is um, we all lived together. And so we were able, after every day of learning something about whether it was Frederick Douglass's journey in Ireland or the politics or uh, the socio-political culture of Ireland, how we connect that to ourselves, we always came back to conversations of our identities. You know, uh, all of us uh, in the group below uh, are from different parts of the United States. Uh, we all have kind of different backgrounds of where our ancestors came from and where we live and how we go about, uh, you know, life being black males. And it was important to realize that uh, black people are not a monolith, whether they are in the United States or they're venturing abroad. And it was so important for me to be in that environment, be in that community, because not only did I learn so much about the other black men in the group, but I learned so much about myself and how I interacted. Uh, and, you know, I told Dr. Brackett that these, you know, these dudes will be my friends for life because of how closely we connected uh, over uh, in Ireland and over the subject matter that we talked about. All of us had uh, different opinions, different ideas on what it meant to be a black man. Uh, and we connected that to Frederick Douglass because his whole life, he was discovering what it meant to be a black man, You know how I should be treated by others, but also how I should treat myself. And being in Ireland, I felt connected to that. Uh, Frederick Douglass, I don't, you know, there's nothing said about whether he traveled or was able to meet other Black men while in Ireland, but uh, I know it's important for me to be among uh, other Black men to discuss what it means to be a Black man. Uh, and we connected that a lot to Frederick Douglass's legacy in Ireland and in the United States. And so not only were we leaving a legacy of uh, discovering and renewing and reclaiming our identities in Ireland, but now we were able to take it back to uh, the States. And so I'm still uh, venturing through that every day. And Dr. Brackett will tell you uh, <laughs> every day in her office that I'm always uh, trying to reclaim my identity. And I tell him there's no reclaiming necessary, but <laughs> we'll keep working through what's next. So, uh, because you should be free to be who you are. So we kind of started talking about the freedom components here. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, so uh, there's something that speaks to me and I want to broaden the scope a little bit more because we talked about Frederick Douglass, but we have to remember even in the Kinsey collection, they have images of, like, of um, W.B. Du Bois, as I have even mentioned earlier, and who decided like, I can't do America anymore. I'm leaving and I'm not coming back. And it's within a couple of years of his his journey to Accra, which was um, supported by the president of the time, um, Kwame Nkrumah, who said, come, come here and write a Pan-African uh, encyclopedia. So it was a couple of years after um, he, he was living in Ghana that he actually, um, he, he died. So um, once he passed, his wife was still around and we don't know much about the, the women journeying in this case, but Shirley Graham Du Bois actually did quite a bit. And I didn't know she launched like a TV station in Ghana. So that was a really big deal. But we hear about some of these folks that go abroad. And we also know that some of the other greats have gone abroad and a lot of them go to Ghana. So the fact that 
you know, we're thinking about Frederick Douglass and he goes to Ireland of all places. And that's another component of like, I know about black scholars that went abroad, but usually they go to the motherland first. And so uh, actually Jalen suggested about, uh, to me to watch a documentary that just came out this past week, um, Blood Brothers, which is about Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, which is also, I think the, their, their storyline is a little bit hidden, um, if you even know it at all. Um, about how they were really connected and then they kind of, you know, fell apart due to um, over, like a more macro component to the Nation of Islam. And there's a moment in this documentary where I think it was Cornel West that said that um, these two men were the most free and people did not like it. Because Malcolm X said what he wanted to say, he saw himself as a man, and Muhammad Ali said exactly what he wanted to say and saw himself as a man and no one could defeat that. And so he, uh, the, the commentary in the documentary at that point was that people hated them because they were free black men. And so I think about how, when I know that I go abroad, I definitely feel a freeness that I don't feel here, um, which is very complex and so we could have a whole conversation about that. And it goes back to how Douglas himself felt a freeness that he didn't feel at home, which gave him enough purpose to come back home to see it through. And obviously he would be able to see that. So um, I want to bring it back to Jalen now um, and talk and ask him about um, what he felt when he went abroad and away from America. So Jalen, what did it feel like to be abroad and away from America? Uh, so one thing that I told Dr. Brackett when I first came back is that there's so much like socio-political tension in the United States that being you know, 3,000 miles across the water and being there for a month, you're not engaged with anything uh, that's going on. And especially with all the discovering I was doing, all the journeying, uh, such as uh, here at the Cliffs of Mower, uh, we were able to take a cruise um, around the cliffs and in the water. Uh, you know, I'm not engaged with what's going on back in America. Uh, I'm not, I wasn't engaged. Uh, you know, what was happening uh, politically. I wasn't engaged in anything that was happening culturally. Uh, I was there focused on uh, my scholarship. Uh, and I would say almost my freedom in Ireland, free, you know, from responsibility, uh, free from stress. Uh, and I was just able to kind of be myself. And, you know, like I said before, it was so important and it was such a blessing to be among other students of color um, and students of color that are from different parts of the country because uh, cultures vary across the United States, especially within uh, the black community. So I was able to uh, learn from people. I was able to connect with other people while being away from the States. Uh, it's It was sort of being outside of a bubble now uh, and it was really important and I'll admit it was really hard uh, coming back to the United States for the first couple of weeks. Uh, the readjustment period was longer than I expected, but uh, you know, it was a blessing to kind of feel that freedom that uh, Frederick Douglass felt. Yeah, the, there is such thing as reverse culture shock, folks. So when you go abroad and you come home and you're like, oh, this is still here. So um, I think Jalen and I are kind of closed out with our portion and I know we'll have time for conversations at the end, uh, questions and stuff at the end. So even if you want to put a question in now, we can definitely hold it so that you don't have to try to remember it. Um, but I wanted to end for the both of us when we, um, with this kind of idea that the hidden narratives of being black and free abroad. We don't talk about that a lot, but that's something that I push. I really push for students to go abroad, especially black students because there is something very impactful about being in a different space and, and not having to see yourself, you know, trying to manage the everyday of what the United States will bring. And that is what has happened to a lot of our greats, our great African-American scholars and, and, and whatnot. But also um, you never, here at home, you're never free, right? Right, It's you're never free. And that goes to our soldiers. We have these narratives of not just the famous black folks that we have those narratives for. We have them for them because they are famous, but there's others who we know those narratives exist. World War II, going abroad to Europe and coming back and remem remembering that, no, you're nobody but a black man or, you know, here, there's nothing to it. And even the erasure of them as patriots, right? So it's a very, um, 
important narrative to, to pick up on. And I think it, it aligns with what we usually don't see. And I think the Kinsey Collection definitely has done that. And luckily today, my, my students from my research methods class, which included uh, Jalen, uh, were able to go this morning to the Kinsey Collection and take a look. And it was really wonderful. And I found some uh, additional gems in there myself that I wasn't anticipating. So we thank you for uh, giving us space to talk about some of these hidden narratives and to make a connection um, across centuries with uh, Frederick Douglass and Jalen Antoine, right? We'll always have those connected. Um, and yeah, we'll pass it back to, I guess, Professor Sims, maybe you'll um, get us to the next group. Thank you, Dr. Brackett and Jalen. Um, thank you so much for that discussion and the photos and sharing your experiences abroad. Um, next, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Nancy Bristow and Rosalind Bell. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Sims, and thank you to uh, Dr. Brackett and Jalen Antoine for sharing those reflections. You know, Jalen, there's still so much I want to hear about that trip, but thank you for sharing and in such a public space with all of us. That's really special. Um, and again, it's really an honor for us to be here, in particular alongside these friends and students and colleagues, and to talk about the impact and the resonances with the artifacts from the Kinsey Collection. So the task for Rosalind Bell and I today is to engage with the history and aftermath of slavery, the forced enslavement of African and African descended people that lasted for almost 250 years in the United States. So we wanna begin first with the document from the Kinsey Collection, and then we'll move from there to a conversation about work that Rosalind is doing in excavating and reclaiming her own family story, learning how her own family has lived in a sense as Christina Sharp describes in the wake of slavery. So first, let me share my screen and give you a look at the document that's at the center of the beginning here. The document is a piece of the past that I think is really soul shattering in a sense in its contents and its capacity to share for us so vividly in such a simple but deep way, the cruelty of enslavement. In her magisterial novel, Beloved, Toni Morrison reminded us that there's no such thing as a sweet home within slavery, that at its heart, enslavement was a horrific institution designed to dehumanize and wrench submission and labor from human beings. A polite veneer could never change that. And this letter for me is a living example of that truth. So here we have a letter it's written by a man, AMF Crawford. He's a letter writer and he's also an enslaver. He sent a 16 year old who's soon to be 17, a young woman, Frances, away from her family. He's used his legal rights of ownership to sell her away from her entire family. He's treated her as a piece of property, as chattel, as he was legally allowed to do. He asks the recipient of the letter to explain to this young person that she had to be sold because he needed the money to buy horses and build a barn. But he didn't tell her this himself. Only on her delivery of the letter would she discover the horrific purpose of her trip, not only to deliver a letter, but to deliver herself from Charlottesville to Richmond. The cruelty of this act, the loss it must have meant for her is impossible for me to imagine, but this letter calls on us to try. To remember that this 16 year old, almost 17, was a full person. Did you like to sing? Did you have a favorite color? Maybe you had a good eye for color. Did you have a favorite sibling? Did you have a sweet tooth? Did you like to swim? We don't know. This letter shattered her world and her family. And that, to be quite direct, is what slavery was. And this enslaver knew what he had done. He knew this young person. He speaks of her over and over again in very positive terms. He knew her humanity. He also knew her talent and he knew her feelings. He knew the inhumanity of what he'd done. And that's why he says he couldn't tell her. He says she does not know that she is to be sold. I couldn't tell her. I own all her family, he says. And the leave taking would be so distressing that I could not. Instead, he dodges the truth and sends her away, separating the family for all time, 
perhaps, and she never knows it until her arrival. In 2021, there are those who ask why we look at the past. Why can't we move on? Well, as the black writer James Baldwin, one of the most important writers of the 20th century, told us over and over again, history matters. He wrote, the force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways. And history is literally present in all that we do. He said further, history is not the past, it's the present. We carry our history with us, we are our history. If we pretend otherwise, we are literally criminals. So in her two most recent plays, C. Rosalind Bell has helped us understand the realities of two very difficult topics, the history of Hurricane Katrina and the era of integration following the Brown decision. I met Rosalind through the Race and Pedagogy Institute's Community Partners Forum and soon realized her remarkable ability to help us understand how it is true, this notion of Baldwin's, that history is something we carry with us, that it is in us, that it is part of our present. She shows us that in those two plays. They may be about Hurricane Katrina and integration, but those words don't begin to sort of fill in what it is that she's able to make happen, which is to bring us to the inside to the feelings, the emotions, the interiority of those who experienced these two historical moments. And she's now at work on a new project called the Louisiana Project, in which she is excavating, reclaiming, learning, discovering, and attempting to make some kind of sense out of her own family's past. She calls it the Louisiana Project. So Rosalind, I'm gonna to turn to you now with a series of questions that'll give you a chance to tell us about the work you're doing and the importance of that work, I think, in the present day. Um, but let's start just with the simplest. Tell us about the work that you're doing, this enormous project that you have taken on. Oh gosh, don't call it enormous. I get, I'll get i get afraid, I'll be afraid. You know, that little pastime that you do every now and then, Ross. Yes, uh, tell you about it. Is that what you said? Tell you about it? Well, it's what is it? What is it? Explain it to the folks who haven't had a chance to listen about it. Speak loudly for the people in the back. Okay, it's my Louisiana project. It's born of a need of mine to find out about the real and true Louisiana. And there go the country. Uh, long discussions growing up in my household, my father, history major, my mother, everybody uh, in the family was interest, was always talking about race. They were called race men and race people then, and they wore that with, with honor because they were concerned about the betterment, the uplift of the race. Uh, growing up in an environment, I was from first through sixth grade, I was in schools that my parents either taught at or aunts and uncles were at, they, they were all black schools. Uh, the Brown versus Board of Education crawled, the decision crawled to Louisiana, got there around 65, 66, and so 67 was when Lake Charles, Louisiana really opened up, the school, well, really opened up and integrated the schools. And my staunchly Methodist, died in the wool Methodist parents, sent us, my sister and I, to Catholic school. So I knew something was up. Uh, at the bottom of that was, they were afraid of how white teachers, teachers would treat us. So I call it um, protection money. They paid for us to go to school so that we could be protected. Little did they know, ah, you can't protect your children from racism. Even in an all black, society, you can't. After my parents uh, died, the, the need to know, uh, not just about my um, coming into the world, I was adopted as a baby by them and in family adoption, secrecy surrounding it. But in that secrecy, I knew that there was land in the family and I knew that, I knew, I knew that in that family from which, from, from which I was adopted, from whom I was adopted. Um, that led to, how did this happen in the late 
1800s? How did that happen right after Reconstruction or right during Reconstruction that this great grandfather was able to amass a thousand acres? How did that happen? And it still be in the family, not the thousand, but close to 400. How did that happen? So that was the impetus uh, behind learning, behind wanting to know more. And so what kind of research are you actually doing? I mean, are you just sitting at home on the computer looking things up? I, I know that's not the case. So tell us a little bit about literally your research process, because it's really quite a remarkable story. I think. Well, I journeyed, well, actually most, any Tacoma, I have I owe a great debt of, a, a great debt of gratitude to people in Tacoma and all across the country and some out of the country for helping me to do this project because research, when you leave your house, takes money. You have to travel, you have to live somewhere, you have to eat, you have to actually pay copies. Uh, these copies were a dollar a piece at the uh, clerk of court's office in the library. So it was, it was very, it was expensive. And I did a GoFundMe uh, challenge or GoFundMe, whatever it's called, to raise the money to do it. And that's why I said it's, it's a citywide or countrywide or worldwide effort with people who helped me to do that. I was in, I would arrive at the courthouse in West Feliciana Parish, which was my focus because that's, that's where the grandfather, it's where the land and that's where all that stuff is. I'd arrive at nine and I'd leave at four. I would uh, immerse myself in every aspect of the office I could. Uh, they're huge, if you think 45 by 45 books, that 45 inches by 45 inches books that are repositories of this country's history. And wherever I, I like to, and I know we're gonna talk about this later, later Nancy, and we can do more, but I like to tell students or anybody who's interested in this, that if there's been war or enslavement on the land, the records exist. And when I teach classes at UPS, I, I, that's a question I throw out about why do you think that is? And invariably, you know, somebody will, hazard the guess that it had to be because, well, war, it makes sense, but why are the records for enslavement? And so folks would ultimately say it had to do with them not being people. They had to be accounted for just as, just as the horses and the cows and the wagons were accounted for. So were the people on the same ledger. Julia, 450. Pharaoh, 550. One leaf of hooks, $2. One set of tools, $8. All in it. So the, the inhumanity of the process is what, I, what I've been digging into and how my people fit in. And the other caution about research is go in as, as much as you can with a clear slate. I went in with a hero already in mind and I was destroyed because I had to destroy him. I had to topple him or he toppled right before my, when I, when I dug into the, and then there were other heroes that I had nothing, no idea existed. True heroes. Can I ask you to follow up there? Because one of the things we suggested that maybe you would talk about are a couple of the surprises or the really important discovery. I mean, if it were up to me, we would just stay here for several hours and hear every story that you've discovered, but they won't allow us to do that. So are there a couple though that you want to share? Moments that really, as you said, that, that crushed you or lifted you, or you discovered things, you excavated things that were really meaningful for you? Uh, yeah, and some did the same thing simultan simultaneously uh, through, the, the, there's a beauty attached to, to research, even to the, the hard, horrific uh, finding out about your enslaved ancestors. The one, of the, the one that I knew most in, in, from the records was the, was the landowner. I was 
uh, shocked to find out that there's a, there's a plantation, there are plant, plantations all over uh, West Feliciana Parish, all over uh, the Mississippi River, for all the way from Minnesota down to into the empties into the Gulf. But when you get to Mississippi, where there was enslavement, there are plantations on either side of the river. When it goes, when it dips into Louisiana, you cannot throw a rock without hitting a plantation. They were so chock full of plantations. This was an 1858 map. That was the, that was the industry. That was commerce, and it was on the black in the back of black bodies. So ancestry, everybody you know has their thing about ancestry, but what they what they have are uh, they have chat rooms. And I, I happened to be in one one day looking, and I saw a name that I recognized as uh, the bullet from uh, Seattle and recognized that name, and I knew the family started off in Kentucky. So a woman was looking for information about it. So I, I didn't know her. I texted her and said, I have a book with an exhaust, it's an exhaustive book of the Bullitt family biography. And we exchanged emails and I saw that her email said Aruba Mar. And I said, are you from Aruba via email? And she goes, no, I live in Gig Harbor. And I'm like, what? I live in Tacoma. So what are you researching? West Feliciana Parish. What are you researching? <gasps> My mother's from, my mother was born in West Feliciana Parish, she says. She lives right across the bridge. We became fast friends. She came over, brought all, all the research she'd been doing for years. Make a, this, this is a very long story, I'm gonna make short. We, we did do the test after, after sharing maps, sharing information. We were, our, our kin people were always like this. They were just like that everywhere one of them, it was the connections were there. She did the test and she be, she found out we were, I was her mother's third cousin. So with that, the connection we had, we had been working together. She'd been, she'd been coming over here every Friday for months. And when that happened, so we'd already uh, bonded. Through her research, she has, she had access to family documents that I never, no amount of research in the world would have made me privy to. In those documents is a story about my great grandfather. One of her ancestors owned plantation. He was on the plantation. He was allowed, he wasn't allowed his daughter was getting married. The plantation owners, his kin people, took the daughter to New Orleans to get her trousseau. Now, is, you, you, did you see how crazy this is? They have her wedding in the man in the what's it called? Not mansion. What do we call plantation house? And the color, the the book, the in family book says. The colored guests were allowed to look from the balcony. Ah, well, he's colored. He's black. Uh, he's mulatto, right? But still, according to the ancestry census. So yes, there were surprises all the way around, and that one is that one is a particular one because she has so much detail in these these family books of hers that I would I just wouldn't have been able to get. Well, one of the things we've we've talked about off and on over the years is what it's like to be doing this history, um, this history that is your history, right? So many people explore the past. We call ourselves historians. You're interested not only in understanding what history means on the inside for people, which we've seen with so much of the work that you do, but in turn, this this project is about you and your people. Um, how has that been different from some of the other projects? And again, perhaps all of your projects have done that, but I think it's a really um, important piece of what you do to be excavating um, a history that's yours. 
What, what is that like? What does that mean for you? Why do that when surely, as you say, there are moments of discovery that you, maybe some days you wish like, mm, I would have rather not have known that. And there then here you are and you keep after it. You're absolutely right. Uh, I, I actually stayed, I made, made plans to stay in uh, Natchez, which is an hour drive to St. Francisville where, where we go to work every day. And that was on the advice of a researcher who told me, I said, but I have relatives, I could stay for free. And he said, no, 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 no. You have to speak to people when you live at their house. You won't wanna speak to people doing your research. And I thought that was kind of silly. You know, you say, hello, good morning, goodbye, you know, but it was absolutely true. I was broken nearly every day that I came home and I wrote, I had a, in, a, in the bathroom uh, on the wall, I had a big piece of paper. And I said, if I come out of this alive, or not crazy, I've done something. So I came out alive, barely, and I, and the other part is left up to you to, to, to decide. It was, it was, it was, uh, it is very hard, but it needs to be done. I mean, I walk out of my door every day. I live in a predominant, I live in Tacoma, uh, in the, where am I, North End, predominantly white. And I, and I, and as long as I'm in my house, I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. I have the best neighbors. But when I walk outside, I'm confronted with the fact that, ah, this is truly your neighborhood. Yep. So that's, that's a pervasive feeling for anybody who doesn't live in a black neighbor, a black neighborhood. Even if you live in a black neighborhood, you live in a white country. So you're reminded if you go to the grocery store, if you make, if you have any kind of dealing with, if you're a postman, if you're black in a black neighborhood and your postman is white, you could be friendly with them, but you still have, there's still a barrier that the United States of America insisted exist. And it still does. So it has to be a conscious effort to, for white people especially, to not be racist. It has to be, it has to be every day. For black people, it's not so hard because you, if you do the, if you do some missteps, you will, you could end up very much like, you name the person on the, in the, night, the nightly news, even tonight. And that doesn't, I don't mean uh, misstep in a violent action. I'm talking about a, mis, a misstep verbally, what's considered a, mis, a misstep by white America. So um, I don't feel safe in this country. I have better reasons why now knowing, in spite of what all the, all the teachings my parents taught about race, going into those archives and seeing how entrenched, how enveloped this country is. I mean, that's that's what the country is. That's how the country was built on the black on the backs of black people. And I think I think if if black and white people, but especially white people don't wrap their uh, minds around that, I will still be getting questions from well meaning white people like my sister's friend who said to me, when she, she grew up in, a, in the same city that we grew up in, in Lake Charles, we didn't know her. She said, as a kid, she would go to the beach with her parents and wonder why they had nice, beautiful sand on the white side and the black people had grass. I, I, didn't, want to, I didn't answer her. I will answer her now. It's 10, minute, 10 years later since she's posed that question, but it made me angry that she, had, that she felt that she could come to me and ask me that rather than go to her parents. They're the cause of it. They're the ones who live over there and are mandating these restrictive covenances or, or yeah. So one last question and then we'll open it up so others should have a chance to ask, ask you and as well as Jalen um, questions. But so some people may be listening right now are thinking, well, hmm, now I kind of want to learn about my people. You know, I, I think you're really an inspiring 
example of, of, of the courage that it takes, but also the curiosity and the energy to go after this, what would you say to somebody who's sitting there thinking, hmm, I don't really know how to do that. So I guess I won't. What would you say? I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what I would find. But if the curiosity was what led me. So if they have the curiosity, they have 90% of it because the curiosity will lead you into these doors that will lead you into other doors. And it's just like anything else you bring your attention to. If you put your attention on it, it'll grow. If you don't, it'll die. So I put my attention on that and these doors opened and they continue to open. I would say to them, uh, ask questions, make sure you take out that phone with that recorder and get to your eldest ancestor first. The, we, we all know that accidents happen and the oldest don't always die, but in the, in the scheme of things, that's what happens. So you, I would get to my eldest people first and interview them. Then I would make the trek to wherever they grew up or wherever you, what, whatever your focus is, wherever that is in the country or the world and go on that land. There's nothing like being on that land. I went on that land and I felt things. I felt things. It is so chock full of memory. It bleeds, it bleeds. You can't stand there without feeling something eerie happened here. Thank you so much, C. Rosalind Bell. And we'll turn it back over to you, Professor Sims. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I got chills with that last response. Um, Amelia, is there time for me to pose one question before we take questions from participants? Yeah, absolutely. Our chat has been a little quiet. So those of you who are listening in, it's time to start asking your questions in the chat. But um, for those on the panel, ask away. So yeah, it was that last comment that you made, Rosalind, about going on the land and feeling things that I think is part of the answer that I'm seeking with the question that I'm going to try to formulate. So I'm I'm struck by um, the presentations by Jalen um, and and Rosalind, um, the fact that you went out that that there's this ache for learning about your history learning something about your identity um, and that the way that you're doing it is going out in the world, interacting, engaging with artifacts, objects. I was struck, Rosalind, by the ledger that you held up. Um, you went abroad, you went to another country, um, Jalen, to, to meet um, Black men from across the nation who'd gathered there. Um, and for me, as someone who could live in a library and just read books, right? Like that's kind of how I'm oriented. I, I'm hoping that you can talk about this urge to do experiential learning and what that is like, what it's like to look at a ledger, what it's like to, to go to another land and, and um, have that recognition that Black people are not a monolith. Um, if you could talk about what, what it is you gain from doing the type of research um, and learning that you've described for us, which is not sitting and reading something passively, but walking on land, observing, looking at objects. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Jalen, you go first. Um. I guess visiting um, visiting Ireland and getting kind of like the experiential knowledge and and kind of learning not only about Douglas's legacy in Ireland, uh, I guess uh, what I would say is that being in Ireland and getting to do all of this and doing it. Uh, Thankful for Dr. Brackett for uh, putting in that word and I guess I got to, I guess I don't really have any word right now uh, for that. I would actually invite Rosalind to go first because I just can't seem to find the words. Uh, but okay. going to Ireland experiencing all of that was uh, um, 
Rosalind, would you like to go? I'm still trying to find the words. I'm sorry. For that. Okay. Uh, well, the, the first thing I remember telling a relative that I was going to go, uh, I knew enough. I'd been to the property enough to, to kind of wind my way to it. And he said, no, uh, I think you need, you're going to need a couple of hoes and some shovels and, and I'm like, and a metal rake. And I'm like, what? He goes, well, there are boars out there and there are uh, snakes. So the boars, I didn't think of like, these are terribly mad, angry pigs that are huge and that they're calling a nice little boar. Uh, but the snakes got me and I'm saying like, oh no, I'll wait for you. <laughs> so there's that. But there's also the memory. This place is chock full of trees. And they're, they're, the, the roads are narrow and windy, 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 winded around, winding around. And the air. The one thing I have to tell you is it's not far from Angola. Angola, the, the Louisiana is notoriously sad prison which houses mostly black folks. And it's called Angola because in that area of the country, those people who were brought from Africa in chains were from the Angola region. Um, it, it, I'll, okay, I'll go there. When I went back, I did go back by myself and I just got over my, my trepidation because I needed to experience it by myself. That's when I heard voices. That's when the trees were talking to me and, the, and I knew there was blood on the ground. There was blood on the ground. There was blood on the ground. So I felt that and I'm whole, and right here, I might be looking funny because I'm trying to, my tears are forming right here. Um, I felt incredibly sad. And I, I, you know, I would save my tears until I get back to, to Natchez and, and write about it. Uh, but they were, The feeling was also one of gratitude to be able to visit this land, to walk on the land that these people who made me possible walked on and to do what I think, what I know they would want me to do with this knowledge that they provided, this opportunity that they provided, that they worked there to the bone to survive so that I could survive. Jalen, um, I want to rephrase the question um, because I, I don't know that I was clear, but I'm thinking about the Kinseys, right, and how they said that they had this ache to learn about themselves, their own family, their history, and they did it by, and then that set them on the path for collecting, right, um, creating this collection. And it seems to me like you had a similar impulse when you decided to apply for this opportunity to travel. Like you wanted to learn about yourself, but you chose to do it by acting, right? Not just by sitting down passively reading. Does, does that help? Yeah, that does. Um, you know, I didn't go to uh, somewhere where a lot of my ancestors are from. I had to step into another space that you know, institutionally and historically it was not made for, you know, people like me and the cohort that I was traveling with. So being in an environment where it's not exactly like, you know, United States, but it's similar in a lot of ways. Um, you know, having that bond with other people who are you know, experiencing similar things uh, around the United States, but now in Ireland, escaping all that and feeling free to talk about uh, a lot of what we were experiencing and, you know, how we uh, go uh, on, a, go through our worldview, uh, you know, what we believe uh, is, you know, how we should live our lives and what freedom and what liberation looks like uh, and how we could achieve that. Having that, those types of conversations with people and having the freedom to do so is, was the integral part of finding out more about myself and 
uh, my identity. And uh, that's what I think a lot of the cohort would tell you as well. Uh, you know, it was, uh, we had a space outside of the United States and still in, you know, a very white country, we were still able to make that space because historically black people and people of color have had to do so. Uh, we've had to create those spaces for ourselves, but uh, because of the kind of situation that we were in, you know, being scholars and being overseas, uh, we were able to form that bond and, and not only learn about uh, Frederick Douglass's legacy in Ireland, but how our legacies are, you know, interconnected. And, you know, the reason that we're in Ireland is because of him. Uh, Frederick Douglass was didn't go to Ireland. We probably wouldn't. We probably would have been somewhere else. Uh, but uh, I'm thankful for you know my ancestors. I'm thankful for Frederick Douglass uh, for going there because that opened up the door for me to go there. And you know, Dr. Brackett and the AFAM department, you know, uh, able to send me over there, and I'm super glad I got to represent. Uh, Dr. Brackett, uh, the AFAM department and RPI for going over there. So yeah, it was it was definitely the feeling of freedom that was an integral part of finding my identity. If I can just jump in for a second, because uh, I just wanted to share why I chose to ask Jalen if he, he wanted to go and then write the recommendation. So they had sent a message through our international programs and they said, hey, they're opening this up to all universities, even PWIs, because this global fellows program is usually only for Hispanic serving institutions and HBCUs, uh, historically black and uh, colleges and universities. And so they opened it up this year for the first time to everyone, which means that was a higher applicant pool as well. And I was like, I had to think in my head, I specifically am looking for a black student, right? That's, that's uh, primary for me and how I engage with sending people abroad, but I knew they were going to Ireland. And I was thinking to myself, who do I know that will embrace this opportunity no matter what? And not seeing it as I'm going to a white place and I, there's nothing that I can engage from this, but that they would really engage with it and actually really want to go. And no matter what happens, <laughs> they would just go with it and then gain from it and reflect back on that. And that's when I decided, I think Jaylee might do this. And I asked him and he said, sure. And he went fell, fall through. And then that reflects what he engaged with. So when you're going, to, he's going to Ireland, they're not going to be talking too much about collectives of Black folks. They're going to be talking about those few Black folks that might have visited or some Brown folks that they're talking about, like revolutionary kind of Brown folks. He didn't even show pictures of like Caesar, I think it was Caesar Chavez, maybe on the wall. I can't remember the people, like murals and stuff. So I, how do you engage with that experience as a Black person, right, in Ireland? and not wanting more, right? Because you're not going to the continent. And so I had to think very strategically about someone that I thought would actually engage with it and take whatever it gave, even if it didn't have a direct connection to ancestry or anything like that. And he did. So uh, that was what was probably most important. And I think that the other thing is when he talks about being academic in those spaces, there's a freedom to be academic in a space that's temporary. Because sometimes in our learning environments, especially a small places like our liberal arts schools, you can't always be um, honest in how you want to engage with new information or old information. And in this space, he was in a very high functioning intellectual community that was ready to have debates and conversations and then still be friends and a collective from then on, based on what I have been able to get from what Jalen said. So I wanted to add that in there as well. Great. We have a few questions in the chat. So for Roslyn, has the research approach of Zora Neale Hurston influenced your own approach in certain ways? <laughs> I'd like to think so. Um, and I, I, I laugh sometimes, uh, you know, when those not too funny laughs like, oh, Lord, are we going to end up with the unmarked grave? Like because the parallels there there are parallels, but then there's there's the end, right? There's the. But I don't think she would have had it any other way uh, to live her life than the way she did it, you know. Um, we we are benef we are benefic beneficiaries of her largesse in terms of 
how she spent her life documenting her, the culture, her particular culture, um, to show the universality of love, people, love and people, and that being the penultimate, the knowledge of oneself, and one's culture. So, yeah, is that does that get to it? I think so. Does anyone on the panel have any follow up questions? Thank you. Renee, are you gonna? Well, I was just gonna ask um, Rosalind if, if she wanted to elaborate what you meant um, about the end and the unmarked grave. Like, what are you, what are you thinking about there? Well, uh, <laughs> she, she uh, Zora Neale Hurston never had a, uh, a job that required, say, a social security number. <laughs> you know, she was a freelancer all of her life. And she did work at some institutions. But what I mean is she wasn't a nine to fiver. So she cobbled a life in the arts, a life of letters. She made that up. She did that herself. There was no uh, model from which she grabbed. She had an overarching need to tell stories about these people from Eatonville, Florida, and to make them as important as anybody in New York City or Cheyenne, Wyoming, for that matter. Uh, but these were Southerners, and Southerners have, at, especially at that point, were tended were tended to be looked down upon. Even though the universities, even though after enslavement, the university systems, the college systems were in the South for Black people. You know, you had Wilberforce, yes, but you had most of them in, in the South. But still, uh, the specter of enslavement was on the South. And so if, you, if you're still down there, something's got to be wrong with you. Why aren't you up North in carotid sugar? You know, yeah. So at the end of her, near the end of her life, or uh, I don't know. She knew it was. She was sick, and without money. Um, all the uh, patronage that she had long enjoyed. Those people were either dead or mad at her, or or something. But she was so uh, just given to knowing what she wanted to do with her life, and that was to leave this mark. And she did, and she did it. And so she died a pauper. She died. Um, without money. I think money had to be for burial, even came from friends. That's what I mean by the unmarked grave. Uh, uh, Alice, was it Alice Walker or who found her gravesite and gave her the resurgence that has ha that continues to this day? Resurgence and introduction of who she was. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. Um, and Latoya, you just put a great comment in the chat about uh, some of the, the letter from Zora Neale Hurston that's at the Kinsey Collection. And that relates to a question in our Q&A about uh, Jennifer hasn't been able to see the exhibit yet and um, plans to go soon. But how would any of the panelists describe the experience of seeing that exhibit and what uh, should a visitor expect? Um, I'll start. <laughs> uh, unless Rosalind, did you want to go? No, I, I heard you. Okay. Um, well, I just went this morning uh, with some students, and uh, you just—it's—it's not extent. It's not gonna take you a, across the whole. It's a good collection. It's a good size collection, but it's not overwhelming. That's the word I'm looking for. It's not. It's not too much to engage with. Um, and then you just have things from. It's. I don't really know, like all different layers of African-American life. And one of my, I didn't get to the Zora Neale Hurston one until near the end. And I was reading it out loud. I was just like, mm, dang. I mean, like, <laughs> it's pretty intense. And I was like, this is good. And I was like, put that on Facebook and see what people got to say. I just <laughs> loved like the, the energy. And I think it speaks to how she lived her life. And I think Rosalind speaks to that as well. And the only reason I know more about uh, Zora Neale Hurston is because Dr. Grace Livingston of RPI and AFM really appreciates her, uh, Zora Neale Hurston as a 
as a writer and she knows a lot of the hidden histories of Zora Little Hurston that uh, many of us don't. And so I've always been looking at a different, with a different eye now. And I was gonna, first thing I'm gonna do on tomorrow is talk to Dr. Lewis, like, you've gotta read this. Have you read this? She'll probably be like, yes, I've read that. I'll be like, okay, well, can we read it again and talk <laughs> about it? So um, it's very powerful piece. Um, and then it's beside another letter to someone who was connected to the Kinseys that that's why they had that connection, uh, the letters. And it was another letter just kind of talking to him about um, the experience she was going through. And this is specifically about a divorce. Um, and so that was just a really great piece. But I mean, there's so many different layers. I think there's a wall of crisis magazine covers that was really impactful. Um, each one has something to share that you can reflect on and think about maybe even how it might be today. I was looking at some and thinking about how, hey, that looks a little Afro uh, futuristic <laughs> a little bit there. Like who would have thought that that drawing was there back then? Um, and then of course, ledgers. Uh, I saw a led something about um, insurance for enslaved people um, from Albemarle County. It was an Albemarle insurance company and I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia. So I grew up in Albemarle County. And then when I went to the actual exhibit, which I couldn't find the details online easily, but when I went to the exhibit, I was able to see that, yes, it was actually in Albemarle County as well. So it's most likely, because I didn't know if the, the title of the insurance company necessarily had to be with the area. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I think there were some other, you know, some really beautiful art. And then it goes until contemporary as well. So you have some, there's a really great painting um, of a black woman that was in 2011. And basically she says, you know, uh, without African, uh, that we were forced here, right? Africans were forced here, but we are what made America beautiful or better, better. And then it actually showcases uh, all the inventions that African-Americans had have brought to the United States. And I, it took me a while to find that because they don't tell you that in the title. Um, it's, I forgot what it's specifically called, something ancestors, something ancestors uh, hit something but yeah I think you can find a really uh some really great pieces there uh that will speak to you directly and you'll you'll start to look at things that maybe you've thought about like the uh program from the march in Washington march for jobs and we always think about MLK who's like literally almost last but one of the things that I enjoyed looking at and then I tried to see if my students could pick up on it was you know what was missing which were black women but they had this one section where they have Medgar Evers wife and they literally Jalen actually pointed it out like she don't have a first name it's just Mrs. Medgar Evers you don't hear her first name and she's basically speaking on behalf of all these this list of a whole bunch of other women uh, in the movement and that was it I was like that's it and then the other women on there are, are all singing that's it so everybody else and then I don't know, Jalen could speak to the fact that we picked up on the representation of Jewish folks, uh, like rabbis and stuff. And he was like, well, we're the Muslim leaders. And I said, you know, they're not gonna be there. So it's a really unique way to engage with history of things that you don't always know the full truth, the full part of. Um, and so then you can kind of pick up, you know, really pick up on it. So that was my exciting feedback from today. Now I'm, I'm good, I'll pass it on. <laughs> this was a very, very, very good time in her life. She looks to be about between 30 and 50. She's, she's black, she could be 100. That was a joke, nobody heard. Did y'all hear my joke? You get my joke? She could be 100? Okay, <laughs> all right. That, that work that you're referring to is by Ava Cozy and it's called Ancestor's Torch. Um, and it is in okay. the art the bigger, bigger space. And I encourage everyone to spend some time with it because her dress is just filled with all the inventions that we live with every day that we take for granted were invented or made by black people. So um, thank you. Does anyone else have any responses to the Kinsey show that they want to share before we, we wrap up? Um, we'd love to hear and it's okay if you don't. I encourage everyone to go see it. Um, Jalen, I want to invite you to share thoughts about the exhibit. Uh, there was one piece in the exhibit. Well, the first one I noticed was the Frederick, uh, Frederick Douglass bust, uh, which I enjoyed. Uh, that was like the most detailed aside from uh, photographs that are taken. Um, but one of the exhibits, or two of them, that I talked to the other, my other uh, classmates and Dr. Brackett about was, uh, one was a letter that uh, Malcolm X had sent to Alex Haley about meeting uh, 
meeting with him to discuss uh, writing uh, the biography of Malcolm X. Um, and I'm personally a big fan of that book. So seeing that letter was kind of cool. And then there was another uh, art piece and I'm not sure what the material was. It kind of looked like uh, molded clay or, or some type of uh, artistic approach in, in that sense. Uh, it, was the, it was called Loss. And it was uh, a face, a face of a Black person with two arms uh, kind of uh, covering their face and their head. And, you know, that one kind of just spoke to me in a way that, you know, this artistic, you know, piece kind of displays the, the frustration, uh, the constant hiding of emotion that Black people have uh, historically had to go through. And, uh just kind of shielding themselves from everything that's being thrown at them. I think uh, that was definitely the Kinsey piece that I, you know, was kind of inspecting for a while. Uh, but the exhibit was uh, amazing. A lot of uh, art pieces uh, that really took my breath away. Uh, the one that Dr. Brackett uh, and our class inspected on uh, the portrait uh, with Black inventions on them. Uh, and the quote was, uh, we didn't come to America uh, because it was better. Uh, we made it better. So that's a quote that I'll take away from that example. And I would just add, th thank you, Jalen. Um, I, I think that was helpful. I, the bust, I think, is beautifully lit. And I was really struck also. Um, by how it looks in the collection. Um, and I think to use a term that, that Rosalind used earlier about you know, race people um, in, in reading about the Kinseys, um, I know that they were active um, in the civil rights movement. They seem like they come from um, a lineage of race people. And there were moments um, at the museum where you know, like with the Frederick Douglass bus, with the crisis magazines all against the wall, um, that kind, that that idea struck me. Um, the the pride that they had, but then there were the you know the, the iron shackles um, that people wore during time of enslavement, and, and some of the contemporary art that was shocking um, to me. So I think it's a mixture of ideas and um, artifacts that that um, cover the whole range of the experience of. of people of African descent here in America and all over. So yeah, that's, I hope that answers the question also. I just wanted to add one more thing. I think that there's an image that I think might be the actual size of the door of no return. So the, the thing is there's not any context of what the door of no return is. So actually I was talking to one of my students about it, um, but I, looking at it, it was so huge looking at it, and I've been to the Door of No Return several times at Elmina Castle in uh, Cape Coast, where it's a very small door specifically so that people have to, you can't have a lot of people try to rush through because they don't want someone to over, overthrow. Um, they don't want enslaved people to overthrow on their way to the boats, and that would be when they would never come back to the continent, so that's why it's the Door of No Return, but I'm pretty sure it's almost, I think it's the, it's the real size. Cause I was just, it was so huge. And I was like, I think this is the actual size of it. Cause that's what we could walk through. So that also is a very unique engagement especially if you actually like myself have been there and can draw that connection um, of why it would matter for it to be so big. I just wanted to throw that. I think that was one of the first things that I was kind of like, what am I missing here? And then I, you know, you read it but you don't get that insight about it too much. So you also have to do more engagement and you have to, you have to take thought. Not everything is gonna, the title isn't gonna give you everything. And that's what I also appreciated about it. If the United States was really serious about ending this thing, they'd make, make it possible for every person in this country to go through the door of no return. And let's start with white people. feel it, see it, believe it. I agree. And that's one thing to bring with you when you do visit is just 
give yourself time. You can get through relatively short, but if you want to really absorb a lot, someone um, said you might want to take two days. And I, as someone who works in the building and has seen it dozens of times, find something new to, to break my heart or lift my spirits um, every time I go up there. Uh, so please, please come. We're free every Thursday night from 5 to 8 p.m. if, if uh, money is an issue. Uh, it's pay what you can on Sundays. So please uh, come see the Kinsey collection. Uh, it closes at the end of November. Um, so there's plenty of time still. And I just want to thank all our panelists for your thoughts and your honesty and, and sharing your bravery, sharing with us uh, today. Um, we really appreciate the partnership and we really appreciate each of you being here today. And hopefully we will see all of you folks who attended um, next week. We're doing this again. Um, <laughs> With some with some different people, some familiar faces, um, and and just thank you. If anyone has any final closing thoughts, I'll let someone else take over. Well, I'll just plug the last event. So um, next Sunday is our last conversation, um, and the title of it is "The Portrait of Slim: Images of Blackness and the Kinsey Collection." Um, and uh, we're going to have members of the leadership team having conversations inspired by one of the paintings that um, is part of the collection. It's not at TAM, uh, but it's in their, their book. It's by Henry Bozeman uh, Jones. Um, it is at TAM. Of, it's just tiny. Is it? It's this big and you don't see it because it's in the middle of the giant room. We'll find okay, it. Okay, <laughs> I missed it. Which is why, like you said, like I want to go back and look again because I know that I wasn't able to take everything in the first time. So it is there. Um, yeah. and, and the questions that we're going to consider next Sunday are what are the images and objects in the collection that resonate for the panelists and why, um, but more specifically, um, how does this collection relate to our work as educators at University of Puget Sound? Amelia? Do you have something to say, Rosalind? Yeah, I was, we yeah. I was inviting, when I was inviting everybody to go to, to uh, the, the uh, door of no return, I meant to Elmina Castle to go to oh. Ghana. <laughs> yeah, okay. One day, the, and I believe the door is as life size as we we could get it. So just to answer that, mm -hmm. thank you so much, everyone. Um, have a great rest of your weekend and be safe and be well. And I'll see you next weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Latoya. Thank you, Jayla. Yes. Thank, thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.